Hello and welcome everybody to the Switch RPG Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Gio, and I'm joined, as always, by Just Johnny. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? We're doing good. Stuck at home. Driving ourselves and other people in our house is crazy. We're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> if this is your first time listening, this is the show from SwitchRPG.com, where we bring you the latest in the world of RPGs on the Nintendo Switch. This week... We're kind of doing a little bit of catch-up. We didn't do an episode last week because the episode before that was late. So whatever, we're back on time. Here we are. Uh, we got quite a bit of news to talk about and maybe some E3 news. So hmm, you, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what's going on with that. Uh, but first and foremost, don't forget to visit our Discord channel, discord.switchrpg.com, as well as our Twitter accounts and Facebook, SwitchRPG. And we have some merch on there if you're at all interested in wearing some of our stuff now johnny what yep. have you been playing uh kind of the same old same old I've been yeah. doing reading historia playing uh actually surprisingly a bit more of rfl okay playing that like a few hours uh at, at the end of every night um ah, ah, like the game's not bad Yep. It's not bad. It's actually a game I would recommend. It's not great at all. Not even close to being great. There are some areas in it that are a little frustrating. But uh, when it comes to actually like someone's jonesing to get recommended uh, a game to play, if they're jonesing for something, I would actually recommend this. Holy cow. I can't believe you would even recommend a game. Because, yeah. you, you know, the, the, these past few episodes, you've been just down on every single game, especially games that I enjoy. I don't know, like anime-inspired games, things of that nature. <laughs> and you just you just poo-poo on my parade, and it just I just I cry about it off off camera. So, I just I just like to poo-poo on bad games because oh, there's so many more good games out there. Sure. I don't want to. I'm not poo-pooing on them because I like to poo-poo on them. I'm just <laughs> poo-pooing on them because uh, there's just people. I'm, I'm, I just want people to focus on the good stuff rather than the bad stuff. Gotcha. And sometimes in order to do that, you got to poo-poo on the bad stuff. All right. Well, enough poo-poo talk. Uh, what else you got? <laughs> uh, just uh, daily Animal Crossing hijinks here and there. Um, daily, not... daily and hourly. You are, I, I see, uh, not that I'm spying on you, okay? I'm not spying you on you. It pops up. Yeah. It, it does. It pops up. And it's not just you. It's like... Everyone on my friends list is playing Animal Crossing, and here I am playing Divinity Original Sin 2 for, you know, however many hours, and you got people playing Animal Crossing, like, everyone. It's it's insane. Animal but, Crossing is going to be the best-selling RPG of all time. Wait, you no. Best-selling life sim <laughs> of all time. Yes. It's an RPG, man. All right, we'll get into that. We'll get into that, okay? We will get into that. Combat less RPG. Oh boy. Okay. Um, do I do I even want to go on with what else you're playing? Because you're really. Uh, I'm playing. I'm also playing Heroes of the Storm just a little bit. Yeah. So you're getting a little bit back into it, or just kind of just tinkering. Just with my friends when they were they were looking for people to play with, or I was actually looking to play a game with them. And... Okay. Uh, that's a pretty good go-to is Heroes of the Storm. So okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it, have you played Heroes of the Storm? Nope, nope, I haven't. It's a uh, a MOBA. It's kind of like League of Legends or or Han, right? If people play that anymore, or Dota Two. Um, it's like those, except uh, with Blizzard stuff. Right. I still don't like Blizzard. <laughs> I don't. I don't I'm not going to say that Here's the Storm is good because it's not it's not great. Right. But, it is, but you didn't hear that from me. OK. Blizzard is not good. Blizzard is not good. No. <laughs> Blizzard bad. Blizzard bad. They're on my they're on my bad list. Oh, They've been man. on there for a bit. Gotcha. They're on everyone. They should be on everyone's bad list. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For they're on your bad list for a while. I mean, I, I think maybe until Diablo four comes out, maybe that'll get people back on their side. Um, I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, that might even make it even worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I've been playing, thank you for asking, I is I was gonna lead into it. You, you lie. I was lie. about to. I was no, about you, to. Well, I beat you to it. God, it makes you, yeah, you 
<laughs> well, I've been playing Divinity Original Sin 2, um, right. much to everyone's surprise. Uh, but I will tell you, I am at the very last boss of it for the Let's Play series. So this may be the last time I ever mention it on the podcast. <laughs> In this segment, anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. In this segment. I mean, it may always be mentioned. You know, who knows? And what, what would you move on to after that? Well, I was really hoping this would kind of eek into Trials of Mana. Um, I almost timed it right. Oh, so, I yeah, that I was forgot. that was going to be my... That's my next big, big one. So that's, a, that's at the end of this month, right? It is at the end of this month, yeah. Uh, that's so brutal. Yeah. If so it was I, right now... That'd be fantastic. That would have been perfect. I mean, I, I, I'm sure I could find something to play. I, I still want to, I still got to play through like Children of Morda. I haven't beaten that yet. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there are, there are a few others that I really want to get through and kind of, maybe I can just maybe complete some games for once. Or some, some very old GameCube classics that, uh, you now have mm-hmm. access to. We may have to talk after recording here. Cause I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I thought it would be kind of just plugging play, and it's yep. a little bit more involved. So it we'll, is a little involved, yeah. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll discuss yep. off off camera here. Um, playing, still playing Dark Side of Genesis, and, and like I had said previously, it's actually gotten better as time has has moved on, or I've moved on with that game. So I'm really enjoying that, as well as uh, playing Operentia. Now Operentia has run into a major issue here. Like, there's, there's kind of the first major boss, and it's not just one one enemy. You're facing, like, five enemies at once, and the difficulty spike is absolutely ridiculous. And here's the problem, though. There's no way to, like, grind and gain levels in Operencia. So once the enemies are killed in the environment, they don't respawn. There's no way to respawn them? There is absolutely no way to respawn them. So it makes it very, very difficult to kind of get up to the, to the level of where this, these, well, this first boss is to, to, to kind of defeat him. What I, Evan on our site is also playing through this game, and he experienced the exact, exact same thing, where it's just kind of a, right at the boss, he wasn't able to do anything. He actually had to, re, and you can respec your characters, he had to respect everyone in order to get past these these guys, these enemies. Okay, so you guys just played badly. Um, and you're I playing badly. We we played too well, I think. I mean, there's absolutely no way we played badly. Um, I have a very good cast of characters. I have I have um, a mage. I have a kind of a sword and board dude. I have. Two, uh, a, an archer and a, a rogue. So I have a mix of everyone. Now and that's that's where you messed up. Doing a mix is the wrong way to go. It's not the wrong. How is that it, the wrong way to go? The right way to go is okay. all or all sword and board that have the capability of healing. Okay. Right. Yep. So I'm, all I'm, tanks that can heal themselves, tanks that or heal. all mages uh, that can blow up. The enemies, and at least one of them can also heal. Also, okay. that's how yeah. you do it. Okay, got it. I'm, you, don't need, you don't need archers because archers are just weak fighters. I, you I don't wrote it down because rogues, rogues are just weak fighters. But oh, you need spiders. Yeah, but I want I want to experience like the the uh, I want to be able to experience every single aspect of like I want to. If it's an RPG, right? So you can, you're supposed to be able to build it how you want it and kind of be able to push through. And, you know, just, again, just push through as you want to build your character. And I did, and I'm almost being punished for it, and essentially, so yep. it's not good. That is not good. And he actually says there's another, there's another boss down the line where it happens again. So I will have to respec all my characters. Is there a penalty to respecing? No, no penalty. It doesn't cost anything. Oh, so... That's probably part of the design of the game is it, the I fact that there's no cost to respecking. That's probably part of the design where uh, fighting a boss becomes a uh, kind of like Diablo, how you can change up your on, skill sets on the fly. Passes, mm-hmm. right? yeah. Like spec, you're changing your spec because it's kind of like a puzzle element, and right. especially and this, for a turn based combat system. 
And this is a very puzzle-heavy game. It, like I said, it's a first-person dungeon crawler loaded with puzzles. All right, so that's by design. I don't see a fault by that. If it's not penalizing you for respecking mm-hmm. and it's allowing it and making it free means it's also encouraging it, I don't see any fault in that other I, than mm-hmm. you chose a party that is less efficient than <laughs> all board or all mage or mixer of board and mage. Okay. I mean, that is that is a possibility. Maybe it is my party makeup. But, I mean, if if you're wanting your players to experiment with respecking and things of that nature, I think I think doing it this way is 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 not the right way. Well, I I guess what they could have done is have a disclaimer somewhere like a tutorial tip that says by the way, you can respect whenever. And if combat's hard, uh, try respecking and reinitiating in combat. Something like that. Like add a message so that the user is aware. They might that- have they might have had that. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I just I just don't think that's the right way to go about playing a game. Again, it's a, it's unless that's your puzzle aspect of your game. You really should just play it as you want it and be able to progress. Like, this is seriously, like, my party gets wiped, like, the second turn. It's just uh, wiped. Yeah, but th- did they ever did they ever advertise it as, hey, uh, your, your tried and true spec that you went through is set in stone and it's viable no matter what, right? This isn't... I mean, it's, it, not, it's, sold, it's yeah. not sold that way. I don't think any game is really is there sold is, that There is, though. Uh, the Outer Worlds is sold that way. The Outer okay. Worlds, they sold it as whatever your spec is, you could play through the game and beat it based on that spec, right? Fallout's done that way. Like, all the games that don't allow respecking, they are intentionally saying, and they allow for, like, very dramas- dr- dramatically different builds. Mm-hmm. They are basically saying to the user, like, hey, you can do these crazy specs. Like, you could be very bad in combat and very good in, like, persuasion, uh, and we're going to allow you to do that and still be able to win the game. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. It just seems, it just seems obtuse kind of the way, the way it's done. And, and I'll have to go back and maybe just rewatch some of my older, my own videos and see if they did do something like that, where they kind of just reminded you, Hey, listen, and it's just a one time reminder. You can change your thing and how they word it is another thing. So I, I think that's a very like to poo poo on that particular aspect, I think is not a good, healthy thing in the long term. I think encouraging RPGs to allow players to think in terms of changing up their spec, as long mm-hmm. as they're not penalized for it, in right. order to adapt to each combat situation is is a very good, healthy thing to do. It just opens up more gameplay possibilities. Yeah, and I I guess, but here, the other thing is that you're your when you get gain inventory items when you gain weapons and armor um you're obviously building your characters in a certain way where you're you're given each characters depending on how you built them a specific set of armor or a specific weapon or even you know s- certain spells or whatever you're 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 building towards something and i haven't done the respecking so i'm not exactly sure how it entirely works but i do know i'm gonna have to do it at some point <laughs> it's just it's just disappointing that that's all um but yeah it, you're right it probably is part of the entire process you know where you have to just just do it i guess uh, there's been as i said there's been other rpgs um in the past that have done like they didn't Maybe it's not a skill tree, but it would be something like skills assigned to gear, and you'd have to. Part of respecking is you could uh, equip or uh, or unequip skills themselves. Yep. Uh, that would be sort of your loadout or the equipment itself that you equip and and unequip. For example, Monster Hunter is like this is like the tried and true of Monster Hunter. But where- that's also that's also a gear based skill system like you're about to mention right yeah. i mean everything is based off of whatever gear you're wearing it's it's your build is based on your gear so right. it is your loadout mm-hmm. uh but also your gear is your class too so it allows you to change up classes right uh final fantasy tactics right going way back right it had the job system mm-hmm. where you could change your jobs depending on the 
you know, the many different things, the reasons for doing that. Right, right, right. Ah, <sighs> well, uh, it was just going so smoothly up until the boss. So, uh, whatever. I gotta respec. I gotta respec. I gotta. I gotta just go th get through it. You gotta uh, play better, man. Uh, I guess I gotta get good. I gotta get good. It's just disappointing. Uh, I, anyway, I've also been playing Minecraft Dungeons. Um, I don't know if you've Why? been. Why yeah. are you playing that without me? I thought we were gonna play it together. I, we are. We can play it together. Here, I, here's the story. Okay, my son is absolutely obsessed with Minecraft. So when I told him I had this, it was just. He he's blasted through it. He's there. There's a tutorial level in the closed beta. There's a tutorial level and two different worlds. Right. He's completed them numerous times, and and each world has a difficult level, difficulty level, like world one and world two, not the tutorial, have a difficulty difficulty level based uh, one through five. Five being the most difficulty difficult, and he's almost at level five. So he he's played the beta to uh to its fullest that's for sure but we definitely you and i definitely need to play this it's uh it's kind of a stripped down version of you know your diablo but i think they don't have everything included because it's obviously a close close beta so there's it's just really gathering they're just gathering information so is, is there depth or does does it give an indication that there's some depth to the gameplay when when you say depth what, what do you what do you All right, mean so obviously that? this is not a game that you're going to play for storyline. Th there is a storyline, but right. It's probably very shallow, right? Like well, very paint by the numbers story. Sure. Yeah. Yep. I, I can't, I cannot see the game taking a serious storyline. No, tone. no, it's not going to take a serious tone because again, this is, I feel like this is geared more towards the uh, younger crowd. Right, but right, exactly. but with an older crowd being able to really get into it as well. Right, but what I'm saying is having a story does not mean that it's good, right? No. If I want to if I'm jamming on the button to skip story segments, dialogue and whatnot, right? That's not a good thing, right? No, right. That that's how you know that your story is bad mm -hmm. is if players are skipping it. Well, I I think in, in for games like this, it's you're more paying attention to the gameplay. That's um, what I'm gonna... Yeah, so I mean, there there were a few different weapon types. They had, like, sickles, which, again, are also in the game, swords, arrow, uh, bows, uh, different types of arrows, a lot of different kind of augmentations that you can have. Um, I, I think there's a lot of different variety. Again, really simple, though, um, for, again, for this younger, younger audience. But I think a lot of people are also going to like it. I enjoyed it, so... So that's that. That's what I've been playing. And um, all right, let's get into the news. Uh, first and foremost, Nintendo Everything. Um, now they, they they don't report news. I don't think. I think they basically get it from other sites. But they actually reported this one. Kind of surprising. Uh, all Bioshock and Borderlands games will be available separately on the Nintendo Switch eShop. So. There will be a bundle available, uh, kind of like uh, it says right here, Bioshock, the collection, and Borderlands, the legendary collection, along with XCOM, are, are slated for the 29th, and I, you can get them as a bundle. Well, I mean, when I say as them, I mean Bioshock, the collection, as a bundle, Borderlands, legendary collection, as a bundle, um, or you can get them singularly as well. I'm, I'm wondering... So specifically those two, XCOM, I'm assuming, is not the case because XCOM is just XCOM it, 2 and the expansion. And the expansion or no, did they say they were doing DLC for that? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's just oh, the everything. expansion. Yeah, yeah. yeah the okay. DLC and expansion. But uh, War of the Chosen was sold separately um, mm -hmm. on other consoles and PC. And I'm guessing it's not sold separately for... Yeah. For the Switch, which I is fun. Yes. Yeah. But I think having the others kind of sold individually kind of makes sense. Some people pref would just want to play the original Bioshocks and don't want to play Infinite or whatever. They can just kind of a la carte or they can get it all um, at maybe a discount or something. I, I might be one of them because uh, if it's cheaper to get Bioshock 1 and Infinite than it is to get the whole collection, because mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in Bioshock 2. Right. Right. I, I think you're probably in the same same boat. 
uh, as most most people. But yeah, so I mean, you can get it, and this is digital only. I they're definitely not doing that. If there's a, I think there's gonna be physical for these. Which, again, I don't know if they're going to do it on the same cartridge. I really doubt it. Um, well, oh. if they do do it, if it all does fit on one cartridge, um, then, yeah, I would absolutely uh, get it all on one cart, even if it does have Bioshock 2. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, either way, for some people that wanted to know that. Uh, and then, also in the news rundown here, we have Darkest Dungeon adding PvP in the latest DLC. Now, you and I were actually talking about this um, maybe midweek, and I'm not entirely sure how this is going to play out, <laughs> to be honest with you. Ha having kind of um, player versus player in some sort of arena mode or so, so i i just don't know i don't see how this is gonna work uh it's it's not it it can work right it's it's kind of the same way as normal typical combat is in the game the big the big question is um the whole stress mechanic because that is right. something that comes into play as you go through a dungeon in its entirety whereas stress especially if it's player versus player, uh, you don't really have too many classes that are going to generate stress or build up stress on the opponent. Now you can, there are some classes that generate stress on themselves or yeah. on party members, but that's kind of it. And there's plenty of other classes that recover stress. So right, right off there, stress is not going to be a mechanic in PvP unless they specifically add new abilities that you can change out or or append new uh, stress mechanics when it comes to PvP. Uh, so you're going to lose that. And that, mm -hmm. that to me is a pretty big deal. Um, That's a huge play mechanic, right? It, it is a major mechanic of combat, but it's not... It's sort of a macro mechanic to yeah. combat itself. But then uh, how, how are our things like... Uh... Like you said, your stress. How are things like quirks gonna be a thing here? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, that's how, another one. It's probably gonna be the quirks that your party members have coming into combat. Are they gonna be randomized into combat? Or I don't I, think that would even. I don't think that would work well. Uh, let's see. They have a banner creation tool that doesn't mean anything. Uh, some trinkets. Uh, they can bring a party of four. So. Maybe you can create your own party members, or maybe you could take your own uh, heroes in com uh, in the campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does say that that your campaign heroes, if they die in in PvP, they won't die in the main game. So probably you're taking the heroes from the from the main single player stuff and right over, bringing them over. In that case, like half of the quirks, probably about half of them, don't even come into play when it comes to PvP as well. Right. Because, for example, there are quirks where you get penalized versus Eldritch or Beast. And, well, you can't make a party of Eldritches or Beasts unless they sort of augment the existing... Because there are some classes, like one can turn into a werewolf. Right. Uh, so that could technically qualify but they would have to add additional things to it in order to make it qualify in that way. And then there's other quirks like uh, darkness, the whole light system. Mm -hmm. How's that even going to work? See, in yeah, yeah. I think, I think I'm going to have to do a little research on this um, just to kind of make sense of it because there are so many different environmental mechanics in, there's pl a lot, yes. in play, and having PvP makes no sense. Unless, you are a unless they're adding different quirks, and you had mentioned something that I thought was probably was really interesting, kind of like a PvP ladder or tournament type system where you play throughout the entire tournament or ladder and you, you develop quirks, different quirks in a PvP mode, and those will carry over all the way to the end. That would that's that is kind of how it could work. Now they do have a rank system or states that it has a rank system for this, but I don't think it's a long-term sort of thing. The, the way I imagine this could work, given that like half of the combat mechanics in the game 
are based on long term dungeon crawling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, macro management based gameplay mechanics like the light system, like the stress system, quarks, etc. Um, and loot and stuff like that, but loot obviously not going to be that big of a thing. Uh, so those things, uh, or for loot, by that matter, I mean the items, the consumables that you can use is also right. a long term thing that you need to be concerned with. Uh, so those things don't come into play when it's just one and done player versus player stuff. However, if it is like enter into a tournament and uh, you knock each other out and the longer you go, the more diminished your resources are going to be and the more uh, things you're going to sort of carry over until you get to the very end, you know, the, the grand finale and your party is like very significantly exhausted in mm -hmm. some way or another based on those longer term macro gameplay mechanics actually coming in. Uh, that could work. But right. I don't see anything over here that's saying it's going to have that. So No, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do need to do a little bit more diving or digging for information on that because I just don't see how you take a game like Darkest Dungeon, which has so many different environmental mechanics and have a PvP sort of are arena type of thing. I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, and and there, there's another major fault um, with this sort of player versus player. Having a rank system, there's a, there's a fault just in the basics of how Dark, Darkest Dungeon works is that it's highly RNG-based. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Rank system, you're assuming some degree of competitiveness. RNG bucks the whole. The whole yeah, system. it certainly does. It can yeah. totally ruin everything. Yeah, so it's it's really. Uh, I don't see it's. It'll be fun, but competitive. Uh, their combat system, as it currently stands, with the amount of RNG that it has, is not going to be fun or or competitive. It'll be fun. A couple of times, and then after that, it'll be like, eh, whatever. It's, there's, it's pointless because anyone can win because the RNG is so heavy. Right, right, right. So yeah, we will uh, certainly see. And I don't think do they have a date on that at all? I, I closed my window here. Uh, uh no date I see yeah. listed here. So okay, soon, eventually. Eventually, I will right. try it though. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I well. Like I'll I'll see what it's like first. See if, again. I don't want to be the one wasting my time, uh, playing and the RNG gods just aren't with me. Oh, why not? The devs are wasting their time making a PvP mode. I almost feel like this is a test or some sort of something to do with Darkest Dungeon Two, which is um yeah. on its way. So maybe they're kind of beta testing it with Darkest Dungeon, the OG. I don't know. There, there is a way to get Darkest Dungeon PvP going, but it has to, they have to rethink everything. They cannot just take what they currently have. No. Right? For can't. all the reasons that we've already stated, uh, mm -hmm. if they insert the macro management side of things that make Darkest Dungeon so intriguing, then they could be onto something, but that requires a lot of balancing and refinement. And it's like a whole other, other game. It really is, yeah. considering how much stuff is involved in the regular game yeah and there's probably going to be too many rock paper scissors type elements when they do uh implement that and the rng will the rng itself is just going to kill the competitive mm. nature of pvp right and Dark dungeon attracts very hardcore fans that would appreciate darkest dungeon pvp i would love darkest dungeon pvp but i know that there's just crazy RNG in it that the competitiveness is not going to be actually mm -hmm. competitive. Right. Right, yeah, so we will see at some point. Um, we'll, I, I will be getting more info on that. Um, moving on, we have Minecraft Dungeons, as I've mentioned, launches in May, and it ex actually launches May 26th for PC, PlayStation, Xbox One, and the Nintendo Switch. All, well, at, the same, all at the same time. Awesome. They're going right up against Xenoblade. That, yep. Um, I think it's a couple days before, right? It is. Yeah. Well, they delayed it to that day, so they could have chosen any day they wanted to. Uh, I yeah, it's a that's a big mistake. I mean, it it well, kind it kind of is two different audiences. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, 
especially, you know, like I had mentioned, it's kind of geared more for a younger crowd. Yeah. So they, there is some overlap, though. There is. Well, me, I'm I'm definitely in that in that um, yeah. overlap uh, category. And I'm kind of in that overlap category, too. But when it comes to push comes to shove, like I'm shoving Minecraft way out. There. <laughs> Forget about that. Yeah, I'll probably be playing both of them more uh, Xenoblade more than likely. But and and I'll probably be getting more than one copy of Minecraft Dungeons because I'll be playing my son will want to play and actually my daughter was playing this too she's she's going to be 5 uh coming up so she was also playing so I might have to get 3 copies of this or maybe 2 where they can play at the same time and maybe I'll get I don't know how it's going to work out but potentially 3 copies of this game might come into my house well the fact that it's 4 player multiplayer is very very intriguing it just has to be as good as Diablo different audience I, I totally get different audience. Uh, they got the same cartoony graphics, though. So yeah. <laughs> Same cartoony as Diablo? <laughs> That's just a slight dig on, on Diablo. Yeah, yeah, that is a major dig. <laughs> oh, man. All right, next we have Indivisible. At some point, the Switch will get this game. At some point. Uh, How but does it not have it yet? I, I have no idea what, what they're waiting for. It did release on Switch it's last not- year. Indivisible is not on the Switch. I it wish says, it was. Right in that article, the same article that we are both reading, Indivisible released in 2019 on Nintendo Switch. It did not re- release. PS4, Xbox One, and PC. It released on everything. It is on Switch. It's not. What do you mean it's not? Uh, that, that article is wrong because it's not on the Switch. You can look it up. It's not on the Switch. All right, so we're we're gonna prove the article wrong. Is that it? That's it. I can I can. Uh, this article is on RP Gamer. I will contact Brian Radcliffe. Let him know that he needs to update his article. Um, it, but it, you're right. It it does say that April uh, Indivisible released in 2019 on Nintendo Switch. Place it 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 did. It, 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 we're still waiting for it. You can look up uh, on the um, on the Nintendo Wii Shop if you want. It's it's not there. Uh, but, did it release on like a different region? Maybe that's why. Nope. Oh. Nope. I I did play this game on PC, and I think it's I think it's kind of fun. I think um, I played it on PS4. The demo of it okay. years ago. Yeah. Or and a year it, ago. Yeah. No, years ago. The demo. Oh, it was okay. Like a, uh, beta or alpha demo mm-hmm. it was probably going like three years ago or two years ago yeah it was all right yeah i mean if you want in that article right you can click on the word indivisible and you can go to it, it brings up their kind of uh their cat not their category but their game and when it's released and what it's on and nintendo switch it says q4 2019 it's just it's not out yet but anyway, they'll be getting New Game Plus and Local Co-op now. So right. there we go. Local Co-op making its way onto a game that will eventually be on the Switch. It's elusive. Man, come on. Come on, Indivisible. Let's go. 505 Games. Move it. We did talk about this game last episode. Uh, it's a Kickstarter game, Sea of Stars, uh, very heavily inspired by Chrono Trigger. Uh, where it's got the 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 battles take place on the actual world on the map, where the the characters kind of just rearrange themselves. There's no different battle screen, uh, but they just announced. I think it was hit by a a goal uh, that what's it? How do you say this? Yasunori Mitsuda will contribute to the music of the turn-based RPG Sea of Stars. Developer Sabotage, Sabotage Studio announced. And he, he is best known for work on titles such as Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, and Shadow Hearts. So he's also joining Eric Brown, who is the current composer. So they're going to be helping, getting help from the dude who they're inspired by in this game. Uh, didn't Masuda work on Xenoblade as well? Well, it says he worked on Xenogears. I'm not sure if he worked on Xenoblade. He also worked on, I think this is the same composer that did like 
the Inkados and uh, Xenoblade and I think <laughs> like uh, two. Blades. That's it. Uh, well, <laughs> Those are... a, bunch of, a bunch of other games, obviously. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Listing some some Nintendo relevant ones. Uh, is there? A well, list? Yeah, I got a I got a wiki list here. Xenoblade Chronicles. He did the ending yep. theme. Um, Call he's it. got Chrono Cross, Mario Party, Xenogears are kind of the older older titles. He's... The original Xenoblade. He did Xenoblade Two. Mm-hmm. Did he do Xenoblade X? I. Maybe that's why X isn't that great. <laughs> well, it, no, no, if if he wasn't Paul, because I I do not like the soundtrack of X. X is not that good. <laughs> it is very different. Yeah, it's th- that soundtrack was bad. Uh, I believe, some songs were bad. I believe some your your brother likes that soundtrack. He's okay with it. He likes the game a whole lot more though. Yeah. Not. I mean, I think the game's awesome. But the soundtrack was not good. It, no. compared to, especially compared to Xenoblade 2 and 1. Those right. soundtracks were phenomenal. He also did uh, the expansion, Torn of the Golden Country. Uh, let's see if he did um, Bait and Kados. Uh, he might have even done that. No, I'm not seeing it on here. The people that worked on um, Chrono Cross. Uh, mm-hmm. Here. Yep, he worked on Chrono Cross. So I think he actually did do... Bait and Kados. Potentially. Bait and Kados, Bait and Kados. Yes, no, yes, no. Nope. I'm not I'm not seeing it on here. I don't see it either. Uh, but that is they are kind of like a tight knit group. The mm-hmm. people that have worked on the Xeno Gears games, a lot of them, as you see, just with this one person, uh, worked on Chrono Trigger, Xeno uh the Xeno Gear games, uh Xeno Blade games like uh, Xeno Saga I see on yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, so like these people they're like in a very tight knit like group of RPG maker like professional aficionados. Mm-hmm. So when this person's involved, uh, you know it's going to be good. Yeah, I think just this alone will get a lot of people's attention. So, yeah. Oh, he's also working on. Oh, that's right, Edge of Eternity. Uh, yep. My brother AJ. Yep. Uh, Edge of Eternity, AJ. Yeah, Edge of Eternity, AJ. Is he yeah. is he there in your room? Uh, he he just walked shit. in. How how's the music? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, he says the music's <laughs> fantastic because I, it has the same guy who worked on Xenoblade One, Xenoblade Two, Chrono mm-hmm. Trigger. Chrono Cross, etc. I agree. I agree. I think it's gonna be. Uh, I think it's gonna be good. Uh, but did you notice the date on this game? Uh, did I notice the date? Yeah, it's, it's not like. Good. What do you mean? It is not good at all. Are you, you are you talking for Sea of Stars? Yeah. Well, they, that's that game's not coming out for a while. Twenty twenty two. Right. It was just kickstarted. It is two years ago. Away. Two At years least. away. Yep. And I think that some of that is because they don't know where or what consoles this is going to come out on. That yeah. could that could potentially be what's kind of holding them up. I I don't I don't know. No idea. But yeah, it's it's going to be a little bit. It's going to be a little bit. If it's a good game, I mean, whatever. They're definitely you... ambitious, right? Because it's that's a big uh, development cycle. I'm sorry, what you were breaking up there. Uh it's they're probably being in, ambitious because the amount of time that they're spending right. this game is quite lengthy. And they did say this game obviously they broke the Kickstarter goal, but they did say this game's coming out no matter what, so Yeah. But yeah, two years for for a decent game. Um I'm, I'm okay with that. Two years I mean from we're now. Well, we're very early in the process, too. That's what kind of happens with Kickstarter games, right? So a lot of a lot of it's concept initially, and you know they try and get you to play or kind of get you to see some gameplay, things like that. So that stuff is so so early. So when they actually get started making everything else, yeah, it it takes takes not, some time, right? Not quite. It depends on the game. Yeah, uh, the ones that that tend to break records and get a whole lot of uh, fame and fortune. Uh, are typically the newer ones, right? That get the praise because they were launched on Kickstarter. But there's also games. Don't forget, like Platinum Games did a Kickstarter. That game 
is releasing this year and their Kickstarter was this year. So that's a very short turnaround. Right. But I think that game was for the most part done. Yeah. You know? Anyway, what else we got? Legends of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 4 coming to the West this fall. This was actually a surprise to me. I, I didn't think the Switch was going to see the light of day for this game, especially because Trails of Cold Steel 3 was very, very late in the Nintendo Switch, uh, or coming to the Nintendo Switch. But there was a recent trailer that dropped, uh, NIS America and uh, Neon Falco, Falco, Falcom, have revealed the legend of heroes Trails of Cold Steel is making its way to North America, North American audiences this fall. I don't know exactly when, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're getting it. Uh, well, the, the switch and the PC release is coming in 2021. Did, so, did you see the, the shame that is <laughs> the, uh, frontline edition differences between the switch version and the, uh, the PS4 version? What, what do you mean? What do you, the PS4 version comes with the soundtrack CD. Oh, okay. Whereas the Switch is a digital download. Because the CD doesn't actually fit into the case. Uh, it shouldn't fit into the case, right? Typically, like, these extra editions are... Special boxes, things special like that. Special boxes, right. But I think they're also being, you know... I, I agree. It doesn't fit into the into thing, and they'd have to repurpose a special bigger box to contain the audio CD. Right. This also screams to me as a cop out uh, for development costs. So. Um, not many people use CDs, anyways. Uh, those people are crazy. <laughs> Fine, digitally. Fine digitally makes no sense when you can just get a CD and get everything digitally from that CD. Right. In addition to still having the physical CD, I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. But these there are, there are a lot more people now that are the digital audio listeners only. Uh, I love I love my physical stuff. Don't get I, me wrong. I'm with you. There's way more people that want the digital stuff than there are people that want physical, but they are also wrong. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just happy that it's actually coming to the Switch without us having to port beg, so we will see it. It'll be alongside the release, most likely as the PC version, but PlayStation 4 will get it initially. Yeah. This, this is a result of it's always getting that first game in from a developer, whatever, mm -hmm. it may be, whatever their first game is, getting that first Switch game in, ported over, uh, uh, from one platform to another or developed first, right? Uh, or the engine, right? Uh, getting that first one in is always going to lead to more. Even if the first one in wasn't outrageously successful or, or broke even, or even if it was a, uh, did a little bit worse than breaking even, their next one is going to almost for certain be uh, profitable in some way or another because a lot of, there's a whole lot of work just doing that first sort of release on a new platform that you've never developed for. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, now, did you want to talk about this next article here? Uh, this seems like it's up your alley. I mean, if you don't, I can certainly... I yeah, can certainly. yeah. Oh, that one. Um, now, we can skip that, because that's... Let's quickly mention it. How about that? Uh, what, you're talking Platinum Games teases a fifth Platinum 4 announcement. So it's not the Platinum 4 now, it's Platinum 5. The bonus stage tops off uh, the series of Platinum 4 announcements. Uh, their fourth announcement was... What was it? It was so weak. I, it was an, I thought it was an April Fool's Day joke, wasn't it? No, that was... I have no clue. If you look at the bottom of the article, it says April Fool's Day joke collaboration between Platinum Games and Hamster Corporation on Soul Arresta. Ah, oh, that's right. And that, that was... They actually spent time making that, and it turned out it was not actually... Whoop. Oh, you can't hear that, right? I can I can hear it very loudly, actually. <laughs> you can hear that? Oh, I can hear it. Oh, no. Why, why are you able to hear that? It doesn't make I, any sense. 
I don't know. Magic, I can hear it all. Okay. Well. Wow. But I don't I don't know what what this is, why it is. Not a clue. Yeah, all right. That game is like a space shooter type thing and it's fake. Uh so So this is like the true this will be the true fourth announcement. Is that what it is? I guess the fourth announcement. I mean the fifth yeah, right. Yeah. I, I think the fourth announcement was just a reannouncement. So April Fool's joke, yes. But mm-hmm. also a reannouncement of because at the very end of the trailer it says the wonderful one to one. So what have they actually announced? They got Project GG, Wonderful 101, a new studio, who cares? <laughs> April Fool's joke, which is the Wonderful 101 again at the very end. So who cares? So this is actually the Platinum 3. Yeah, well, they got this fourth one coming soon. No, there, there is no fourth one. Uh, it's- well, the uh, fifth one. Sorry, the fifth one. No, no, there is no fifth one. There, look, once again, announcement the, one and two, those are legit. Right. Three, who cares? That's well, not that's, a, that's you know, their number three. I know that, it is their number three. Their number three is Platinum Games in Tokyo. It's not what should be a third game, right? Right, it's not a game at all. It's not a third game, and announcement number four is a game, but it was a fake game, and then at the very end, they just reiterated hey wonderful 101 so there is no actual platinum five in my Uh opinion it's platinum three and this one coming up is going to be the third one or yeah sure (laughs) assuming assuming that it's an actual game yeah and me personally i think um there's there's very little to come out of any of these announcements uh wonderful 101 all right that's kind of cool project gg it was just a cinematic trailer uh, nothing really to go off there. And like you had mentioned, Platinum Games Tokyo, c- cool, nice for them. But again, not an announcement that a lot of people kind of care about. Announcement 4 is a waste of time, waste of people's time uh, yes. altogether. And now we get this bonus stage, whatever this is going to be. I hope it's something good. Uh, maybe it'll be a Bayonetta thing. Maybe it'll be something new altogether. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But this this they led up to so much hype. It led up to so much hype that this is it's all been disappointing to me personally. Yeah. They, they wasted even more of our time. We said that we weren't going to spend much time talking about it. And, and, here we, and here we are. I blame myself, though. That's my it, it is mostly your fault. Yeah. Um, Jimatsu has an article here. Uh, let me get it correctly. Um, interview with President Toshi, Toshihiro Kondo, Trail Series, Yeast 9, Monstrum Nox, Coming to the West, and more. Now, a lot of people are into these Yeast games, uh, as well as these Trails games, um, but what really got my attention is that Yeast 9 will be coming to the West, and then hopefully, like you had mentioned before, they've done the development on the Switch. Maybe maybe we'll get something here. We probably are. I think uh, 9 is running off of the same engine as 8, and if that's the case, then the turnover for a Switch version, if it isn't uh, hand-in-hand with the PS4 version, is going to be Shorter, significantly shorter. Right. I guess. Um, and just, you know, uh, like I had mentioned, Jamatsu has has the interview here. It goes into kind of pretty big detail about decisions on whether or not to use Unreal Engine. And they're not using Unreal Engine 4. They're using an older engine, like you had mentioned. So, you know, it's it's not it's not a big leap or a big jump to say that we could get East 9 on the Nintendo Switch. Especially with it, you know, now coming coming over. Well, they're already doing. Uh, is Trials Three or Trails Three out yep. on? Uh, so, Trail Trails Three is is coming out uh, really soon. Yeah, I don't know when exactly. I don't have it in front of me. So the work for that's done. The yep. work for Yeast Eight, yeah, that's already you know very much playable. That came out what like right around the same time as Fire Emblem or or a couple months before Fire Emblem. What Yeast Eight? Yeah, on Switch. Oh, that was one of the first games on the Switch. No, it wasn't. No way. So. no way. Well, tell me no way. No way, man. Now I gotta look. It came out like up. either a year after the Switch launch or a year and a half or two years. Lacrimosa of Dana, Yeast 8, came out in... On the Switch, not the PS4, because the Switch version was a full year after... On the Switch, June 26, 2018. Okay. So that was a year and a couple months into mm-hmm. the Switch lineup. So not on launch... And that was a full year before Fire Emblem. 
Yes. And that was a full year after the PS4 version. Mm -hmm. But I, I think hopefully at one point they'll get to an area where they can, you know, release them at the same time. Well, I think this might be it. Yeast uh, 9 very, very well may be that, right? Hmm. I hope so. Hope so. Now, let's see. Disco Elysium is uh, currently um, in development for the Nintendo Switch. The develop yeah the developers there they said that they are uh, they are indeed working on it now this game has really won a lot of awards a lot of game of the year RPG of the year awards for last year right I really do wish that we had this earlier um I I just feel like it would have done better earlier I think well, it certainly would have been better last with, year well with all the hype you know that it was getting I think that would have made it you know, sell a little better. I mean, I still think it'll sell, but there, there's a bit more to this uh, announcement, right? Because the devs kind of said along the lines of "It's coming soon." Yeah. Yep. Uh, here, here's a quote: "It's going to happen soon." So, as long uh, when I hear that, it seems like the turnover is going to be potentially one year or less. I think less. Yeah, or less. Yeah. And that, that to me is great. That is excellent. I don't think this game sold at full retail price. Let me just take a look at it on PC. Yeah, I don't think... I think it was like a $20, $30 game. Uh, 40, 40 on PC. I think it was a $40 game. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably going to be a $50 dollar switch tax game i hope it doesn't have the switch tax i think the game's been out for a while the 40 dollar price tag is right where it needs to be no 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 no, no. if you're not going to have if you're not going to have a physical version there's no need to have a switch tax you know they, you don't need they, to recoup no. those costs okay i'm with you there if it is digital only then sure keep the 40 but being what this game is and how typically uh, cost efficient RPGs are when when it comes to like getting getting the bang for your buck, sure. Uh, you know this is you pay fifty dollars. That's still going to be a typical discount for especially at the quality that this game is at, right? This, yeah. this is like a top top of the shelf RPG experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I just hate to see that for for older games. I think that's a big big turn off for a lot of a lot of people because there's a price difference yeah a well, big price difference me, the switch version now another another nice thing about this is that disco elysium is not a graphically intensive game whatsoever no. so it's probably going to run pretty well or close to pretty well on the switch mm -hmm. i'm assuming that i don't know for certain I, i've i've never actually like seen in depth uh you know how the engine i can hear it all i can hear it all johnny <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> i'm trying to like skip ahead in it, and it's doing it in the wrong ways uh so there are like some 3d elements to to this engine but there's a whole lot of i'm assuming is 2d work and that's not going to tax the switch mm -hmm. uh in in many senses um i don't know it it's not as straightforward as as it could be. So who knows? This could actually it I could see it running well or being there's going to be some some graphical downgrades in play. Either way, uh, this is going to be a pretty awesome top notch experience. I hope so because I'm I'm kind of a with all this hype that's come with it. Obviously, it's won so many awards. Yeah. I'm kind of excited to to play it for the first time. Yeah, and I, going back to my point before, I'm okay with paying the extra amount for the Switch tax because when you think about it, the Switch, you're getting more functionality, more features with the Switch version, right? You're getting portability along with on-the-screen console-style goodness, right? As long as the graphical fidelity is relatively close to par. Right. right. If it is, then you're getting an upgrade in every sense of the way. Right, but that's... I don't know. I know that's stuff that you have to develop for. 
but I mean, that's, that's not a reason to charge more for it. You know what I mean? That's what I think. Mm. Anyway, we, we will see. It's, it's, it's coming our way maybe sooner than we think. I hope anyway. All right, just kind of a new game announcement. Dungeon Crawler Legends of Amberland, The Forgotten Crown, uh, is coming this month, actually. I think it's coming on the uh, the 20th of April. This is kind of one of those first-person dungeon crawlers in the same, <laughs> same style as Wizardry. Um, I don't think it's... I think Wizardry maybe looks a little better, maybe, in certain areas. Uh, but it is inspired by the 8-bit... Uh, graphic style, and um, yeah, just a kind of a kind of a new game coming out. What do you think of that uh, party member uh, size? That party size. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is way too many. Seven. That's yeah. exciting. That's excessive. They can be either pre-made or established, extensive characters to customize. Hmm. I'm reading some of these key features that I, seven party members that are customizable. That's cool. I like that. You like I'm, that? Yeah, man. More the merrier. You know Yo. me. I'm, I'm big, epic. You yeah, know. but that that would just they would all be just sword and board. They'd, they'd be boring as hell. I would make either a party <laughs> of sword and boards like paladins. Though. They got to be paladins. Like someone. They got to have healing, healing characters. Some way of healing. Yeah. Uh, getting rid of the poisons and and the status effects. And just being pure like tanks or going all out mages. Okay. Uh, and because, man, rogues and, and you know, the, the sort of agility based classes or, or dex, dexterity classes, they're just not really good. <laughs> they're not. They're, they're just, they, they, sure, they can deal a little bit more damage, but what you lose in the process is is you lose that that defense that rigidity and now because you bring on those damage deal those physical damage dealers you now have to bring on the bona fide healers right you know top off those bona fide physical damage dealers when instead you could just have a good enough damage dealer that also happens to be a an awesome tank mm -hmm. you and you don't need to what <laughs> Oh, turns. are you done? Turns. Are you done with it? Turns. Is that the final ba boss or are you no, still going? Oh, wow. Okay. I have an update about Dragon Quest. By the okay, way. go ahead. Up update us here. What, what, what in the world just <laughs> happened? My brother just came screaming in, high fived me because he just beat the, the trials, uh, these really, really hard trials that he was uh, kind of grinding and getting end game stuff for on the Dragon Quest. It's, it's like the end, end, end game stuff. He has done a 180 on that game. It sounds like it because he was so down on that game as well as me. I, I am totally not into that game at all. And maybe it's just I needed to get into it, but go, go ahead, continue. Well, it's it's just that he's he has done a 180. The game, according to him, is like such a slow boil. Nothing goes on for like the first 20 to, to 30 or 40 hours of the game. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, something major happens, and the game just gets really, really good after that. But you have to go through 40 hours or 30 hours or whatever it is. Yep. That's a big ask. That it is a is. big ask. Because I, I, I put about 15 hours and I'm like, I can't do this. This is just like, there's, there's nothing that excites me about this game. I don't understand why people are like so into this. Yep. But I just need to play more? Well, it at the very least, it does have the quality. Right. Right. The game yeah, yeah. is, you, you just look at it, you hear it, you play it, you know it's a quality game. It happens to be boring and lackluster for the first you know, 20 plus hours, mm -hmm. but eventually it apparently does really get good, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep an eye out uh, and, and listen, see what my brother's final opinions are when he uh, completes, but he's basically at the very, very end now. He's probably going to do the boss battle. Well, well with, with him 
coming in on his tippy toes, just like all excited about this. I, I think you're going to get a pretty good <laughs> raving review on it. <laughs> oh man, that, that was awesome. All right. So yeah, Legends of Amberland coming soon with all the sword and board characters that Johnny is going to make. Or mages. Or, Nothing. or me, ma- sorry, or, or mages. I don't know. Agility characters are just not, they're, they are good as skill users. Right, they are good in lock picking and stealing. Right, that's actually what they're useful for. Everything else, that's eh, just, eh, they're not good. Just, just so you know, um, rogues are probably one of my favorite classes. Yeah, sure. Once again, <laughs> we have in, in classes and party makeup and whatnot. Oh, whatever, dude. <laughs> whatever. This we're gonna end this episode right now. Uh, it's it's not it's not the fault of rogues and and rangers and whatnot. It's not their fault. It's the <laughs> fault purely with the designers. They have just failed in so many so many times over and over again. They have failed to make compelling gameplay mechanic based dexterity agility based characters. Mm-hmm. They have failed to make them compelling. I right? will tell you though, I, I I played as a rogue in Guild Wars two. That was kind of my main, main character. And I had no need for healers. I could solo easily with that game. I mean, depending on, again, like you had said, how it's developed, how the skills are made. You know, there's got to be some sort of... You have to go in the mind frame that people are going to play this game solo. So you have to figure that, you know, figure that in. You got to have some healing capabilities. And I could easily in Guild Wars 2, be a rogue on my own. I, I don't think that's... Healing capabilities on an agility-based class I don't think is what makes them mechanically interesting. To me, I see... Cause you, gotta, you gotta marry it close enough to the theme of what you get from those characters to, to, the, to the mythos, right? They're that. I mean, we, we could talk about that maybe later on this okay. episode or for a future episode. Sure. There are ways to get it to work really, really well. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, so. I totally agree. That's, but, uh, that's definitely yeah. a good back burner topic though. Yeah. But, but the typical, my big gist is the typical just does physical damage better, slightly better than, than sword and boards like that to me, that's just a poor excuse. Oh, their evasions higher. Big whoop. Well, I mean, you can... Okay, yeah, we definitely will want to take this on <laughs> another episode because you're right, we could we could go on for a long time about this. All right. Yeah. Nintendo has temporarily suspended shipments of Switch consoles. And oh, that is... Uh-huh. Yep, we're, we're, we're moving on, Johnny. Okay. And that is definitely the case because I could tell you, um, not me personally, but I do know someone um, who is in the market for a Nintendo Switch and... It's like almost impossible, not impossible, but yeah, it's very hard to find an, a brand new Nintendo Switch, any edition, whether it's gray boring edition like I have, or the neon edition, or the Animal Crossing edition that just came out, forget that one. It's just really hard to find anywhere right now. Well, in that article, it says it's hard to find, uh, or the shipping is suspended in Japan. Oh, that's just in Japan, but I will say we're feeling it here. Because it's been it's in high demand right now, and shipping in general has been disrupted dramatically a lot, across yeah. Across the board, every single industry with this whole uh, you know, virus stuff. Right. Yeah, so, it's yeah. it's just you and, and you're seeing this on like all these scalpers just kind of raking it in with all these ridiculous amounts of money they're asking for don't give into this don't give into the scalpers please don't do it yeah don't uh, ah but right it's such a perfect time to get a switch right now it really is it's just tough and, and this this person is he already has a switch he just wants to get another one for his wife to play it's just you can't get you can't find one right now I, you can't find the switch lights I, I've seen those kind of here and here and there. Those are more readily available, but personally, I would never recommend the Switch Lite. Nah, but I'm with you. 
it's such a downgrade. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You don't have uh, you you can only play certain game, not certain games, but there are some games where you can't play because there's no detachable Joy-Con, and um, you're right. Well, it's a smaller screen, I believe. That's not the problem. The problem what's, is the lack of a detachable Joy-Con. That's well, yeah. That's <laughs> that's a big big problem. That's two controllers right there. It's, it's not the games. It's the Joy Cons themselves being as unreliable and Joy Con drifty as they are. Mm -hmm. which is a huge problem and you're locked to a portable only system that has bad joystick joy con problems like right. that's, that's huge um i also i have a one joy con at the wherever they fix them because i had the drifting issue it's been stuck there for two months oh because they they've shut down yeah. So they're just. It's when did my, you send that? Um, three months ago. <laughs> it is just. <laughs> it is just there doing nothing, and luckily I have other Switch consoles in my house, so I can just take from them, and you know it's not a big problem. Except for when they're on their Switch handheld, I can't play. <sighs> I'm not. I'm not crying about it. You're crying about it. All right, cool. I, uh, I, I've been wanting to send in my Joy Cons, but uh, I just never got around to it. And ever since Nintendo said that they're stopping the repair service temporarily, uh, yeah, obviously I, I'm not going to send it in now. No, so. no, that, it wouldn't. It, they wouldn't even take it now. Uh, but yeah. this was before everything really hit the fan, and all of a sudden they're just like, "Yeah, we we can't send anything out, or no one's working here." Ah. <sighs> That's the way it goes. All right, um, you're taking this ne next news article. Yeah, I'm, no problem. So this I'm is just a quickie. A, I'm taking uh, a break. <laughs> Monolith Soft, right? Everyone knows our beloved RPG developer that's uh, kind of second party uh, to Nintendo. Uh, and they assist Nintendo, as we know, on other games like Breath of the Wild. Uh, apparently, they helped with Animal Crossing <laughs> development as well. like. Crazy. And and what is what does this all mean? Why are we talking about this? Well, this just further solidifies that Animal Crossing is a legitimate RPG. What complete and utter <laughs> malarkey. <laughs> it is a role-playing game without combat. Oh, we're just talking about that last episode, weren't we? Right. But this is not a there's no character progression in this. You just get items are you, that are you kidding me? There's no there character. The game is entirely character progression. What? You go from living in a tent to living into a small little home. That's not character progression. That's that's a that's life tools. simulation. You get new tools. Those tools can be upgraded, and those tools give you new unlockable abilities. Are you it, kidding me? There's there is totally character progression. That's not character progression. That's life simulation stuff. Off. You don't even start off with a shovel in the game. You start off with no tools whatsoever. The only thing you can do is just shake a tree to get some branches. And eventually, you level up without having a level up system. <laughs> There's no leveling up. <laughs> you, your character progresses oh, into yeah. being able to build all sorts of things. Your character progression is your recipes. Oh, my god! You learn new recipes, and that allows your character more things to do. You are interacting with numerous NPCs. We all know that. This new is an NPC-rich game. Very, yes. There's so many NPCs that just wash up on shore. You are given... Uh, they don't wash up on shore. Oh, what Some of them. But yeah. most of them... They move in. You got to recruit them. You got to. They're like party members. You gotta. You gotta go. To distant, <laughs> I'm serious. You gotta go to distant islands. I, I know you're serious. That's why this hurts my feelings. It hurts my you gotta heart. Go to islands, you gotta talk to them. You gotta tell them about your island. And then if they do move in, you gotta pick a spot where they move into and build their home. But building their home is not so straightforward, right? You gotta actually build certain furniture, items, outdoor, indoor, etc., in order for them to actually be satisfied to move in. So there's quests. Not, that's not the only quest, but there's other quests in the game, right? You're, those you're are like sub-quests, side quests. You seriously don't believe this, right? You do. You do believe this. I'm telling you, this is an RPG. Oh my... I can't... I can't even... I can't even deal with you right now. This... Actually, there is combat. 
Well, with the tar- tarantulas. Yeah. yeah. And the bees. <laughs> Don't forget the wasps. Oh, those damn wasps. Yeah, but this is... Okay. That's not combat. That's... I catch you, you catch okay. me. And that's it. it. Confrontation over. No, no, no. They sting you. They are gone. True. But if you get stung that second time, right? And you got to heal yourself. There's a healing item, right? It's the medicine, right? Uh, because if you get stung that second time in a row or bitten that second time in a row, that's it. You, you, you party wipe and you, reappear. <laughs> I'm sorry, you party wipe and you reappear in front of your home. Oh man. You said party wipe in animal crossing. Yeah. Uh, oh man. I, I you can actually invite, right. You can develop a party, right. You can call in your friends. They can join you on your Island, uh, endeavors right you can become the leader of the party that is an actual thing you can pass the leader right you could tell that you could say oh no i'm not the leader now you're the leader right so that they can do their side <laughs> quest, right oh man yes yes you are right um <laughs> oh no can we just can we just say this is like a simulation game with like rpg light mechanics is that i mean i light- i I wouldn't I even say, accept that, but I would. I would. So I would say that The Sims qualifies as an RPG, and if that qualifies as an RPG, then Animal Crossing is an RPG. Okay. Well, um, there there is more character progression in The Sims than there is in Animal Crossing. No, there isn't. Sure how there dare is. you? How, how dare you? How how dare you? How dare, <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> You can you can you can get different <laughs> jobs and upgrade your jobs in in The Sims. Uh, you can do all sorts yeah. of things. You sure. Uh, f- you know, forget it. Just you get new. It. You get new uh, furniture, new equipment that you have to build. But in order to build, you gotta acquire the recipe for it. You have to develop relationships with the other animal creatures that are on the island. And the better, the stronger the bonds with them, the more recipes they're going to feed you and all that. I can't even. I can't do it. It's got a day-night system. It's got a weather system. Do you cheat in that game? Uh, time travel? No, I don't try. You don't? Okay. All right. I, I don't either. I mean, I don't really even play um, my daughter that plays, but still. She's a budding rpg just like her <laughs> Oh, you're terrible. Moving on. Xbox boss, Phil Spencer, says he has a great relationship with Nintendo. And boy, are is Xbox really trying to get into the Japanese market um, all, altogether. I mean, it makes sense. They actually really, really need that Japanese market. Yep. Um, they I mean, do. what they really need is more exclusive titles to really push yep. people towards them. But I feel like they're they're the ones kind of extending the olive branch where they're more willing to put their exclusive games on other consoles, and we've seen it with the Switch. So, yeah, certainly they, they have a great relationship, uh, no, no, no doubt about it. Now, um, even Phil Spencer, he spent recently spent a lot of time over in Japan. Again, I don't know. I'm sure he's making dealings and, you know, whatever it is he's doing. But, yeah, he's certainly trying to really push for this Japanese market because they do really need it. Uh, trying, but, uh, you know, when, when Microsoft announced that they're uh, purchasing and, uh, and acquisitioning a whole bunch of different developers, uh, which they have done over the past couple of years, mm-hmm. and they picked up so many, but I don't think any of them are Japan-based studios. No, no. Uh, I think THQ was uh, was that one of them. Um, no, no, they did not. They did not. THQ is still indie. Uh, by indie, I mean independent from Microsoft. Right, 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 right. Uh, and that's that's THQ Nordic. Right. Yep. Uh, they acquired the uh, Team Ninja. Yep. Of which there are two Team Ninjas, and this is not the Japanese Team Ninja. I don't know if they're in Canada or, or the UK. They might be in the UK, uh, Team Ninja. But it's the people that made Hellblade. Yes. Yep, yep. Um, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying to pull up what they've recently pulled in for Oh, they grabbed them. They grabbed uh, the people that made uh, or blind. Uh, the people that made uh, Cuphead. Uh, the people did they do that... Obsidian as well? 
I thought they... Yep. Yeah, they did Obsidian. Obsidian, In Exile, um, they're the ones who did, uh, I think, Hands of Fate, uh, Wasteland. So they, they actually, they're RPG heavy uh, in their acquisitions. So they, Obsidian Entertainment, who's done, you know, Star Wars, Night of the Old Republic, they've done Fallout New Vegas, South Park, Pillars of Eternity, In Exile Entertainment, uh, they are the ones who do Wasteland 2, Torment Tides of N- Numenera, Numenera, Bard's Tale, um, as well as Wasteland 3, uh, that was, that's coming up, and those are kind of the big-er ones, I think they're, again, I think, uh, like you said, it's a Team Ninja, they, they, they did them, or yep. whatever, whatever they're called, <laughs> I, I don't have it in front of me, uh, but yeah, they definitely are bringing yeah. in of a lot of acquisitions, and you're right, not many of them are Japanese, and maybe we're gonna have- see a change soon. They have none. They have no Japanese presence whatsoever. Their last uh, presence chance type thing that I can recall is with Platinum Games, with that uh, uh, game that got canceled. Yep, Scalebound. Scalebound, yeah. Though. Yeah, that, that could have been the one, yep. Could have been, but yeah, they're, they're out, man. Uh, they, they're really, they, they know that they are no longer going to be enticing the Japanese audience. I don't, I don't know. If you look at the Xbox sales uh, over the last, I don't know, five, ten years, that's more than enough to tell you how bad the Xbox brand is in Japan. It is hmm. rock bottom, never going never gonna to recover type thing. It's right. just bad. And it, they were they were on top of it for for a while, you know. Initially, with the Halo series and up to Halo Three or ODST or one of them, they were really kind of on top of it. And then I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> I, no. I think I, I don't, I don't think. know. No, I mean they were doing good in the 360 era, mm-hmm. but that was when they were funding projects like Blue Dragon, Tales of Vesperia, uh, the Eternal. Uh, not Eternal Sonata. Um, Etrian Odyssey, I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, not that one. Eternal uh, uh, Sonata was on there as well, I think. Uh, I think that one was a PlayStation. I can't remember if that was a PlayStation exclusive or an Xbox exclusive. So that one I'm not certain of. But Vesperia was, for a very long time, Xbox exclusive. As was Blue Dragon, mm-hmm. uh, and another one. It was, there was another JRPG. Yeah, Eternal Sonata was on the 360. Oh, it was okay. As well as PlayStation Three, but but still, you have those, yeah. You, you have those those JRPGs that a lot of these yeah. that Japan needs that you need to get into. You know, that, that that was when Microsoft was trying to get that Japanese audience in, and mm-hmm. uh, after that, it just tanked. It it didn't go anywhere, and Microsoft should have you know gotten the hint. But yeah, it seems like. Mm-hmm. They can try to go and grab the Japanese audience via Nintendo. That's pr- probably what they're gonna need. They're not gonna. I don't know that. Nin- I don't think you'll ever see Mario or Halo on their o- opposing consoles. You know that that's kind of or Gears of War or whatever. Those oh, are st- I don't think so. I think you will see Halo on Switch. Really? Yeah. I mean that's kind of what all that Xbox has is Halo, Gears of War. Um, you already have the is it Banjo um, and Kazooie, those guys there. Exactly. I, I don't see any Nintendo characters like Nintendo games coming over to Xbox. Mm-hmm. I can see Nintendo characters and branding coming to some games on Xbox. I can definitely see that happening. Okay. Right. What I don't see happening, or, or uh, what I see more likely to happen, is and as we've already seen this Xbox games coming to the Switch uh, that were typically exclusive to the Xbox, uh, and bigger ones coming to the Switch. Mm-hmm. Like I think Halo. It, there's been rumors about the Halo Master Chief Collection coming to the Switch. Yeah, that's been rumored for for quite a while. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I don't know. I just think that's if that's all you that's all they're hanging on to really, and you're just gonna kind of hand that over it just doesn't make sense to me yeah. i don't know it's the whole reason to buy the xbox you know to play that halo game i don't think i don't think halo has that draw it used to but you know that's yeah, halo doesn't i mean reach was bad mm-hmm. i mean people I played people played it you know you played it you played one halo i feel like you've played them all you gotta 
yeah. gotta change things up a little bit, you know. Speaking of Halo, uh, real quick, the um, so they are releasing. I I, I left this h- hanging like I don't know uh, back in like the holiday area area where era when we were playing when I was playing through the Master Chief Collection, and I mentioned that only Reach was available. So apparently they are releasing them one by one. Okay. Uh, and they're doing it in order of uh, story. So All right. In, in canon order. So next, which just released on PC, was the uh, original Halo. So, uh, and that's actually the one I'm excited for. So after that, it'll be Halo 2, then Halo 3. ODST maybe, and then three. I, I can't remember when ODST occurs, but regardless, Halo One is the one that I've been looking forward to playing. So I'll be playing that uh, sometime soon because that is a gaping hole in my uh, Xbox All right. uh, knowledge base, whatever. Yeah, no, I, I I definitely played up to three, and that was kind of where I was like, you know what, I'm I'm done. <laughs> I am totally done. Yeah, I, and I've I've played other. Halo games just not through to completion and playing Reach like it was and that was what the fourth or fifth one uh, of the Halo games and mm-hmm. yeah it just felt like Halo one it it didn't feel like they did anything at all it's mm-hmm. just the same game over and over again and the story was not good at all nope. it was like brain dead kind of lackluster storyline stuff it I don't know why that game got rated as highly as it did. Yeah, I don't know. They're all like I like I had said after three, I quit because they all just continue to be kind of samey type of stuff. Yep. And I'm also really bad at first person shooters, so uh, you, you know what I'm hoping for. Aim assist. Well, with, with this little bondage of uh, of Xbox and Nintendo, what's that? I am hoping, crossing every single finger in my body, uh, for a return. To Perfect Dark. Okay. You seem to like that Perfect Dark game, huh? Perfect Dark is my favorite first-person shooter of all time. All right. I just wish I was decent at them. Like, if I pump pump a lot of time into it, I'll be okay. You know? It just doesn't seem like I get risk my reward. Perfect Dark is what I gotta do, huh? Yeah. The way the game originally on the N64 controller, you would be fine. Hmm. You wouldn't struggle with it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what not, it is. You're not aiming with with two sticks. Oh no. No. I've never played it, so I wouldn't know. There's no second stick on the uh, on the Nintendo 64. All right. Well, no. No, the, the N64 is just god awful. I'm I'm telling you, N64, the way that they did uh, first person shooter controls, because they only had one joystick to work with was actually good. It was simple and easy to use and intuitive. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't have to like it, okay? All right, yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you, but you, you have to, like, try it and, <laughs> <laughs> and know that you don't like it instead of assume that you don't like it. I'm going to assume I don't like it. Um, so The Outer Worlds finally has a release date, uh, June 5th. We're still waiting a while for this. Uh, yeah, apart- they apart- blame Corona. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I could, I could see they didn't blame him. That's a, like a necessary. Like, that's definitely happened. They did. Um, but they um, did blame it. They specifically said on their excuse that mm-hmm. it was going to get delayed in part because the studio doing the port of the Switch game was in China. Um, just of note here, the real t- retail version of the Outer Worlds comes on a physical cartridge after us complaining. Us meaning the people out here in the in the world, the real world. And it will be accompanied by a day one patch that could be up to six gigabytes. Holy Ouch. cow. Uh, this yeah. patch will optimize gameplay, provide additional high-res textures, and include other fixes to provide the employees... Uh, what? <laughs> Am I reading this wrong? The patch will optimize gameplay, provide additional high-risk textures, and include other fixes to provide the employees of... Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I was just reading this as Halicon was, um... Was, like, the developer studio. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, wait a minute. All right, I'm gonna try to get through this again. This patch will optimize gameplay, provide additional high-risk textures, and include other fixes to provide the employees of 
House is it Halcyon? Yeah, Halcyon. That's the the solar system, right? Yeah. With the best gameplay experience, please ensure that you have planned accordingly and have the available space necessary for the patch. I- I'm sorry, it took me a while to get through that because I was just confused about the the whole Halcyon thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're gonna need to provide at least or up to six gigabytes of info. That's quite a bit. Well. Uh... If it means the game is going to look better because of it mm-hmm. yep. and run better, then yeah, it makes sense to me. And if people don't understand why that is the case, it's because it's another location to pull data from. So it's a it's an alternate data stream mm-hmm. where one is on the cart, so you can read from the cart, data from the cart, and then you can also read data from the internal memory, both at the same time. So you can kind of effectively stream data faster because it's off of two different locations right right so that, as long as the cpu very, yeah as long as the cpu can can do that yeah and, uh, and that's a very basic rough sort of explanation of it that's not a hundred percent the case so mm-hmm. uh, part of this is still the fact that they want to save space on the cartridge right by not going to like a 32 gig or whatever size car and paying that extra price. I don't know how many games out there have the 32 gig cart. I know that the Witcher does, but I'm pretty sure that they got some help from Nintendo uh, on that. So Nintendo desperately or really wanted the Witcher three on their roster. So they probably, or what I feel is they would give them a little bit of a discount on these cartridges to get the Witcher and all of its people uh, to play it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel, and it kind of makes sense to me in my little brain. Um, but yeah, June fifth, the Outer Worlds, save your space. Persona Five Scramble. I could have sworn this was already here, but Atlas Survey asks fans about a Western localization of Persona Five Scramble. Uh, per- Persona Five Scramble, for those who don't know, is kind of like a, a Persona Five uh, Misu game uh, essentially, uh, but apparently it has a lot more RPG. It's it's a lot. It's more heavily influenced with RPG mechanics, um, and still action based. But yeah, yeah, you know, no, definitely action based. But it's only in Japan. I I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's just because I watched some gameplay, and I I have no idea. But apparently there was a, um, a survey asking about if they were interested in it and in coming to the West and. I think a lot of people would probably say if they're getting something from Atlas, they're probably interested in the Persona 5 world. They would be very interested in this game. And why, I don't know, why wouldn't you be um, interested in this? Now, I will also say this. I'm actually kind of a related but unrelated topic. Hyrule Warriors is another game I've been really kind of keeping a close eye on. I, I think I might be interested in getting that game. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure why, but I... <laughs> this probably applies to your taste in that other game that was anime and. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I have bad taste in bad games. Is that what it is? You are just a sucker for uh, for like action based combat that looks like it's it's it has RPG mechanics or does have RPG mechanics, regardless of the quality. Uh, Hyrule Warriors has quality. I mean, how can you say that Koei Tecmo didn't put quality into a Zelda sure. game? It has some quality. Some quality. But that quality is not in the gameplay. <laughs> no, it's very basic gameplay, I, yeah. I would say. Brain dead. Brain that's, dead. A, that's okay. Not every game needs to be I, I don't need I need I don't need a degree in whatever college to play RPGs. Not all RPGs are built that way. I agree, but how many of these brain dead action based games are you going to, you know, play? A lot of them. <laughs> you need to play them all. Is that it? Is, I need just, to. I gotta catch. I gotta catch them all. You gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. Well, I mean, what's wrong with that? I play a lot of brain dead games. Like Dark Siders Genesis is a very brain dead. It's a very. It's an RPG. I, it's more on the lighter end, but still. Uh, I would I, say that the combat in that game is way more nuanced than the mu- the Musu games. Yeah, pro- maybe about the same level, to be honest with you. But I play I I play very strategic games as well. I'm playing Divinity. I've played Fire Emblem. You know, I 
Right. I'm but very, what, I'm well versed. You're, you're well, just, you're I'm, just so narrow minded. I'm not narrow minded. What, what I was getting at is, you know, the difference between one Misu game and another Misu game is very, very slim, right? Whereas, uh, don't get me wrong, Persona 5 does seem very different. But when it comes to, like, for example, the Zelda Misu game uh, and the Fire Emblem Warriors, whatever that was. Yeah, you got Fire Emblem Warriors, you have Dynasty Warriors, those those type those games there. Well, I think the difference between Fire Emblem Warriors and Hyrule Warriors is very little. There's they're they're both pretty similar games. I don't that, believe- that's where I kind of say like, eh, I I can kind of skip on one of them and feel okay because they both look like they play exactly the same. They don't. Okay, moving on. Um, let's see here. What what do we have next? Uh, Zeno, uh, Borderlands. Um, no, we're we're gonna talk about Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. It will not include Xenoblade Chronicles 3D extras. Uh, ah, not what a big is, deal. What the heck is this about? It's the Amiibo stuff that was on the oh. 3D, uh, the 3DS version. Oh come on! Is this and, no? And- the 3D visuals, right? The enhancing the 3D stuff. Right. I mean, I, I have a feeling that this game is already enhanced enough. They they don't really need to include this. Now, um, do you know exactly? Because uh, I don't. Uh, what the amiibos provided for this? Um, I'm not sure. So let's see. The 3D version contained new features that included a collection mode and amiibo compatibility. So those are the new features. To me. Uh, I don't know what they are, but I can't imagine them being anything major. Mm-hmm. And to me, that is negligible in comparison to getting this major uh, pro- prologue, paralogue. Right. Uh, that uh, we're getting. Uh, was it an epilogue? Epilogue, yeah. Epilogue, yeah. The, the additional you know, chunk, major chunk that was cut off. Yeah, I, I'd much it, rather have that than, than exactly. Amiibo compatibility. So to me, it's like, whatever. That also confirms to me that they weren't building this off of the old engine. Good. This is off the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 engine. Yeah. Which is awesome. Well, a a union between the two in some way. Because there's there's still some, some areas, some segments that look like they're using the original assets. Maybe. Maybe not. There's some slight overlap. Very slight. Okay. All right. Um, very slight. All right, cool. Uh, Borderlands, we kind of mentioned this. I, 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 I didn't see this here. I would have mentioned it then. Uh, Borderlands Legendary Collection on the Nintendo Switch will be 1080, 30 FPS. That is actually pretty good news to get a game like that running on the 30 uh, FPS at 1080 because I don't even think originally a lot of these games ran at that. I'd yeah. To- uh, yeah. I'd have to look and see, but obviously there's been some optimization uh, down the line here. Um, I don't think it's optimization. It, you got to remember, 1 and 2 were released on 360 PS3, right? Yep. And Switch is obviously pow- more powerful than those older gen consoles. It's not up to snuff with current gen, but it's definitely more powerful than the last gen. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you can, when you are just bringing over these older gen games to the Switch, you're going to get it running at the best possible, right? It's the same thing with Dark Souls, the original, mm-hmm. remastered on Switch, right? Right. It's better looking, runs at the full uh, 1080. Uh, it's not at 60 frames, but the originals on the prior gen consoles were also weren't on 60 frames either. So Right. I mean, as long as it's steady frame rate, that's all good. Uh, yeah. 30, 60, yeah, 60 is really nice once you've seen it and played it. But, you know, as long as it's a steady 30, we're good. We right. are good. All right. VGC rumor Mario Galaxy. Su- Mario Galaxy, Mario uh, Sunshine, Mario 64 will be um will be one pack. Wait, I'm trying to read this headline here. What is what is what happened to my reading scroll skills? Down. Uh, scroll down a bit. It might, it might be easier for you to read. You know what? I quit. You 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 read it, man. I, I just can't okay, do it. Okay, so there's some rumors <laughs> going on, some heavy rumors across the board, like pretty much many different places that you're looking at uh 
on many different websites are reporting uh, some form or another of this rumor. The juicy one that we like to latch on to because it mentions a beloved RPG is the fact that, uh, let's see here. So in celebration of the 35th anniversary of the Super Mario franchise, uh, the video game Chronicles, the uh, VGC, um, are reporting that Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy are going to be re-released on the Switch as part of like a, uh, what was it, Mario All-Stars-like uh, combination. That is going to be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. If they do that. Like you're talking about some of the best of the best of the best Mario games of all time, mm-hmm. all in one though all in one package and then they're also going to potentially release like a uh, super mario 3d world deluxe version because that was a wii u game that's one of the last major wii u games that haven't uh, been brought over to the switch and has been heavily rumored in many occasions for for a while now too for a while and the last major uh, update and the juicy one is that they are going to bring back the paper mario franchise quote a return to form. Uh, so that uh, right there is super juicy because as I interpret it, a return to proper form for Paper Mario is Paper Mario Thousand Year Door style with you know the, the developers of Fire Emblem. Like, but, but a new game altogether, right? Is that how you're reading new, that? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. That's Brand all. New Paper Mario, but done in the way that Paper Mario 2 was done. Right, right. Back to its proper, I guess you could say, um, see, roots there. It's proper hardcore RPG roots. Hardcore, huh? Yeah. <laughs> getting me? I, I mean, I would even like to see uh, like a regular Mario RPG, not necessarily kind of, not necessarily a Paper Mario, but even just a regular Mario RPG. Uh, but yeah, Paper Mario, I still need to get to, I still need to play thousand year door where we'll we'll discuss later but yes having this on a nintendo switch and this was uh, uh rumored to be going on at the same time around e3 so things obviously have changed yep. the uh, reveal for it yeah the rev- right the reveal for it so we'll see maybe we'll get that reveal in a couple months or so in uh that's in a no- big one yeah, that's a big one. i i totally agree totally agree with that one now, to even, have this even, big giant bundle along with mm-hmm. a brand new game to combine it, that's five Mario games potentially releasing within a year's time of, of another. That's yeah, that's quite, a lot. A lot of Mario. Yep. 35 years, huh? Wow. Well, 35 since uh, the original Super Mario World. Yeah, I know. Game. It just makes me feel old. You are old. Shh. I'm not old. We don't discuss that here. Oh, man, we're both old. We're wow. Super. I remember... All right. Uh, okay. I've just come to the realization. Just breathe. That I'm old. Breathe in. Okay. Speaking of E3, okay, we have a couple, of, I guess, E3-ish announcements. Yeah. IGN is kind of doing their own digital event. Kind of like, almost like the replacement for when E3 was going to happen. And this is going to be going on early June. They're calling it the Summer of Gaming. Uh, Mid-June. Mid-June? It says early June in the headline. I'm reading the headlines. I'm, I'm seeing it too, and I see June 15th. That's uh, mid-June. What, what is happening? These headlines. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The cancellation of E3 2020 has left a void in the gaming event calendar, so IGN has stepped in to fill it. IGN has announced the Summer of Gaming digital event that will be held in early June or June 15th. So far... I got that wrong. What? You got it wrong? At, yeah, I was looking at the other article. Jeez. I apologize. So you made me feel so bad. Um, early June is when this is happening. So far, the companies that are participating include 2K Games, Amazon, interesting. Uh, I, as far as I knew, they only had one game. Um, Bandai Namco, Devolver Digital, Google, oh, really? Uh, Sega, Square Enix, THQ Nordic, and Twitter. All right. Uh, with more to come, Nintendo has not been mentioned as of this posting. I think they're going to kind of maybe do their own thing. 
but that's that's what uh the summer of gaming digital event is as of right now. Uh, more details will come in the following weeks, and it's going to include live broadcasts, kind of some on-demand programming. It's I, I'm just curious as to how this is going to be because I think with this here will kind of pave the way of future E3 could potentially be or future summer of gaming just as this is now i think this is gonna kind of be the way things are gonna go oh well, uh, maybe i uh, yeah i it's <laughs> i think it's just gonna save people a lot more money you're still gonna get a lot of eyeballs you know um i understand e3 had a lot of behind the scenes stuff with with uh, marketing and, you know, just kind of people getting to meet each other, uh, talking with each other face-to-face. I totally, totally understand that. So that aspect is kind of out of it, but the fan aspect of it, this is more than enough, I think. Oh, I agree. I mean, I, I, this is the best way for, I mean, it's going to be no change pretty much uh from my perspective on how i experience e3 i always experience it you know via watching it happen on some sort of live stream right so this is just oh i'm watching a live stream from my gn instead of a live stream off of twitch or youtube uh, whatever it just whatever. centralizes everything right well i actually think this is not going to be as the problem will be with centralization what do you because, why, why do you mean well, so first off, there was a scheduling of you knew far in advance when you know Bethesda would do their E3, when EA was gonna, you know, knock off their day long thing, Microsoft, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. et cetera, like Devolver Digital, like you knew, like the PC gaming show, right? Like what's gonna happen with the PC show? Because that was that was also very exciting for me. Was that uh, Square Enix, right? But now these times are no longer set in stone are they going to spread out each other instead of having it all condensed into a you know less than a week's time or are they going to start to spread out so that they can have a little bit of more space in between one another that to me uh sort of deflates the e3 experience because now instead of e3 being like these very awesome five to six days Mm -hmm. it's going to be instead of five to six days worth of awesome stuff it's going to be you know, one, two, three, four weeks of stuff sprinkled about here and there. So it's right. going to be uh, less dense, condensed, and it's going to be more sparse in between uh, major events. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I really do hope that it's not that way and that they're not extending this for, for weeks. And it's more just maybe a week long event. I would accept that. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't want to see it go on forever. Uh, I just think, yeah, that won't yeah. work. That could very well happen because there's no longer a central sort of governing body to sort of right. pull everyone together, all these different businesses. So it, right. it now it depends on each individual company and the decisions, their their rationale for when they want to present their latest updates. Right. And they could essentially do it within their IGN's time frame and just not be on with IGN. Um it's just a shame that IGN is the one who had to do this and not the ESA. Why couldn't the ESA easily shift it over into something like this? Well, that kind of tie- goes into our next article. What is uh, that? Or set of articles. And that the ESA, what they did initially say that they were going to host a digital-only 2020 event. Right. And uh, they kind of announced that what like a week or at the same uh, as part of the same statement when they canceled e3 to begin with mm-hmm. uh, they then said that there was going to be this summer of um sorry that's the igen one they, they did say that there's going to be some like online video type of experience uh digital event what have you mm-hmm. and that has now uh been let's see uh, so the quote from the ESA people is that uh, given the disruption brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, we will not be presenting an online E3 2020 event in June. Instead, we'll be working with exhibitors to promote and showcase individual company announcements, including on www.e3expo.com 
in the coming months. We look forward to bringing our industry and community together in 2021 to represent a reimagined E3 that will highlight new offerings and thrill our audience. So basically, E3, as we know it, is canceled uh, for this year uh, in both physically, as, right. as we come to understand, and digitally now, uh, right. for how they want to or potentially could have expressed it. Uh, and it seems like all they're going to do is announce, make work with developer, uh, it, different companies and developers, and announce it on their websites. That doesn't make uh, any. I mean, who who cares really? Who goes yeah. to e3expo.com uh, for any type of news? <laughs> yeah, and, and and the phrasing of it is in the coming months. So maybe they they will list. I, the best I could see happen is they. On e3expo.com, they list a schedule of announcements or, okay. or expect, expected announcements from these companies. Log on to their YouTube channel, whatever it is, their Twitch, uh, on you know this hour, this day. Yeah, that's the best I can see come from this. If they yeah. are not doing that, then then we're definitely at a major, major loss. <laughs> and to combine that, the other article that we have lined up on news is that they. The EA say themselves, probably out of fear of losing the slot to a potential like IGN, uh, you know, annual event thing because it's being birthed as we as we have just discussed, mm -hmm. and it could go on for a second year and potential third year, et cetera, et cetera, in a row. The ESA went on to state on the record that they are indeed having an E3 in 2021. Mm. And I think you're right. I think it's because like we don't want to lose these dates. This is this is when we're gonna do it. Maybe potentially, uh, who knows? And those dates are June 15 through the 17th, which is only uh, what is that? Two two days? That's three days. Three days. Whereas before it was maybe four days. Uh, well, it was. It, it was it was stretched out because you had you had like say for example it is the fifteenth or seventh you had Bethesda doing their thing on the fourteenth or wh whatever like there was always there was always like room for I don't know other people to jump in there. Well, I'm I'm checking the calendar right now mm -hmm. for where these dates line up. So that is the normal, typical three day reservation. Uh, which is a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That is the norm for E3. Right. And it is also uh, the norm for... That's when the, the actual expo is open, but they do other stuff. Like I just said, with Bethesda, they'll have their stuff off-site. On Sunday. On a different day. Right. Yeah. So, and but, same thing with Monday. Right. right. The, the only actual press conference that happens on the day of E3 is Nintendo on Tuesday. Right. Because Sony's done... Um, as well, I think Xbox is kind of maybe trying to do their own thing as well. So yes, that's essentially you know you know what happens. You have those three days. Those are the three days that the actual expo is open, but it actually almost runs the entire entire week because it runs a couple of days beforehand. Prior, right? prior, like the yeah, first prior. one out the box is typically uh, EA, mm -hmm. which is on mm -hmm. a Saturday, right? And then you have Sunday, and then Monday. Uh, right. All the press conferences that happen on those days. Yeah, so I mean, the the it's a it's a week long. It's five days thing, um, five six days. But yeah, fifteen through seventeen. Set your calendars. Maybe it might be all online anyway. All right, we have no listener questions today. You guys, what's going on? No questions. Email me. Yes, yes. podcast at switchrpg dot com. Get off your lazy bones. There's, you guys got nothing going on. Everyone's home. Send us some messages. All right. So upcoming RPGs. It's actually really. Ugh, it's a, it was a struggle. Not a struggle to find these, but I don't know if you guys are gonna like them. Um, I think what's going on is the calm before the storm of Trials of Mana. So here we go. Convoy, a tactical roguelike, is coming out April 9th. And essentially, this is what you think. If you if you know understand what a convoy is in say a um, a war a wartime where it's a bunch of trucks kind of going on its way and trying to get from point A to point B, that's what this is. Top down, eight bit style, typically supply based vehicles. 
Yeah, so yeah, typically they are they are supply based. And essentially you have enemy trucks coming at you. I don't know if you have to deal with mines, things of that nature. Um and I don't know how the role playing actually works to be honest with you. I don't know how and if there are any skills or if how leveling occurs, but this is again coming out um April. This says April 8th. Your vehicle is the level leveling yeah. up. Oh, okay, okay. So that's April 8th. That is out today as of this recording. It kind of looks a little bit like uh like a post-apocalyptic Mad Max style. Okay. Yeah. It's very heavy into the vehicle stuff. Uh I can't pull up a trailer for whatever silly. Yeah, the trailers aren't working on that. You're going to actually have to click on the eShop or search it in YouTube. Um I'm not I'm not going to YouTube that. But it's a roguelike, so it you know you're not going to get an elaborate, as with most roguelikes, you're not getting a major story. Uh-huh. You're getting uh, action, well, not typically action, but you're getting combat, dense mechanics, right. RPG mechanics. So that's typically what you're getting. I'm just looking at it right now on YouTube. Yeah, you're specking out your vehicles. I don't know. This is kind of like a mech game. Because that's what you do in mech games. You don't mm-hmm. typically call a mech game an RPG. No. All right, and you're specking out your vehicle. I don't see any characters whatsoever. You're, you have a loadout. And right. it's an action-based combat system. Mm-hmm. It's Look, this kind of excites me. I'm down for stuff like this. But uh, RPG, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. It's categorized as RPG. So yeah. I mentioned it. All right, next we have Monster Vi- Viator, Viator. I- I'm not sure how to say it. Just if you're familiar with Chemco or Hit Point, you're familiar with this game. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I mean... The name it, is ridiculous. Right, I, I, I'm just not sure how else to put it. Like I said, if you're, you're very familiar with those games, it's an RP- RPG maker uh, type of game. Ooh, yeah, it is. So... Some of them are decent. I, I, I know that there are maybe one or two of the thousands of Kemco games out there that are really good. Um, there are maybe one or two out there that are good. So this is the next one. The next one in line. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to say it. Monster Viator. V-I-A-T-O-R. April 19th, $14.99 US dollars. Then next, April 14th, we have boot hill bounties this one's actually kind of interesting looking i don't know how it plays to be honest it is a bit graphic um type of rpg um (laughs) i mean what what do you how would you even describe this it's a Uh, it's a jrpg it's turn it's turn-based uh set set in the wild west maybe Menu driven turn based mm-hmm. combat system, it looks like. Yep. It is in the West. There are NPCs, I guess. Uh, there are. Westernized, uh, Western, you know, like old time Western, you know, Dirty Harry um, style world going on. That's different. That's kind of exciting. Uh, right. there, there's like this huge change up when it comes to like graphical presentation like you're getting uh friendly ish looking characters and a side scrolly typey perspective and then in combat you're getting like this almost like realistic first person first person kind of perspective and different like it it is a different art style what you're getting in yeah. combat. yeah it looks uh, very <laughs> it looks very different yeah um, which is fine it's fine uh it it has that what that dragon warrior style uh mm-hmm. presentation dragon quest yeah present- the older character. style yeah so this is april 14th this is uh 15 us dollars as well then next we have um okay now this one i would consider more of a visual novel this is can androids can androids pray blue um i was even really debating on whether or not to put this in here because i did watch gameplay of the of of this video and i watched six minutes of the gameplay and he beat the game so 
<laughs> I, I I don't know what to make of this. To to be honest with you, um, it's a story, w- w- uh, visual it's, novel. Yes, That's it's more of right. a yeah, and we're seeing these a lot more. We're seeing a lot more visual no- novels labeled as RPGs. Maybe there's some choices in there that maybe differentiate the the ending or whatever. I think that's where they cla- then classify it as an RPG because some of the choices you're making influence the outcome. And that's kind of what happened here. It's a very simplistic, uh, polygonal kind of art style. Um, it's it's six dollars and fifty nine cents. I I don't know. I'm not sure about this one. Stay away. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know about this. Like I had Unless said, you want a visual novel, right? right. And I mean, visual novels got to be good, though. I mean, they got to tell a story, and I don't know. Maybe you can tell a decent story in six minutes, but I've read my children's storybooks in six minutes, and I don't know that they're the greatest stories. Not not that it correlates or anything, but whatever. Anyway, um, that is coming out on the sixteenth, April eighteenth. We have Finding Teddy two. We are blessed. I'm excited for this one. Finding Teddy is actually pretty decent. It's a side-scrolling platformer. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, and it's also got some um, music elements into it. So it's got some sort of like Ocarina of Time-ish puzzle elements. I don't know if you've, you've seen the gameplay. I'm, I'm looking at the gameplay right now. This is, uh, it seems like it is directly inspired by Zelda 2. Right. Yeah, and, and it, you, you could say that it is very inspired by it because it's, it's mostly a platformer. It's got some pretty cool design uh, elements in in the background. I kind of like what they're they're doing there. The combat is is interesting. I, I, I again, you're you're watching it right now, so if you wanted to describe it, you certainly could. The the animations are actually really good too. Uh, the world, oh yeah, I mean this is straight up a Zelda two, uh, kind of not. I don't want to say clone, but like a, a game that was clearly looking at Zelda two as its focal inspiration uh for example you can jump and you can do the downward uh storms uh sword stab right. uh you can uh attack enemies uh low or high and i can i just saw it right they're holding their shield up high so if they're holding their shield up high you attack low right that's like typical zelda 2 style combat uh but this is done obviously uh with a more up-to-date not nes style graphics this is more like an enhanced super nintendo style graphics it looks 16-bit ish but the the lighting is somewhat dynamic to a certain degree there's a lot of parallax scrolling in the background Mm -hmm. there's just more lighting effects going on in general uh than what you would typically expect the animations of of the some of these sprites are actually really good uh good in that uh they're not Art wise, they're not like fantastic looking, but they are well animated. Uh, mm-hmm. The characters' <laughs> animations look nice and fluid, and there's a lot of framing frames uh, to these different animations that are going on. You're playing as a girl, you got a sword and shield, uh, just like you would in Zelda. And yeah, there's some platforming. There is uh, NPCs, there are shops and towns that you can go to. This is, uh, like I said, my initial impression was kind of promising and then i'm looking at this and the more i look at this the more i am excited oh i like it yeah this is good I'm, yeah it, i I, good. I think i think of all of them it's it's probably the uh the best one uh to be honest with you so yeah that is called finding teddy 2 definitive edition um we, it's not up on the eShop yet so i don't have a price for it but it is coming out april 16th and in the features, it says that it's uh, got more than 20 hours of pure gaming adventure. Yeah. So. It, it's like, uh, and Castlevania 2 is another mm-hmm. direct inspiration of this. It now, seems like- I, I don't think this is going to be a, a Metroidvania. I think it's primarily just a platformer. Um, well, but- Castlevania 2 is more of an RPG than it is a tried and true Metroidvania. Okay, you're right, right, right. I it, get what you it, mean. It's the step before mm-hmm. a bona fide Metroidvania. Right. All right, and that is actually going to do it for today. This episode has gone on long enough. You know, you guys got to go home, or you may potentially be home. 
You got to go do the dishes or something. You don't want to hear us ranting and raving all day, do you? Yes, you do. Um, <laughs> but at some point, we, we do have some back burner topics that I really want to get into. Maybe someday we'll just, you know, just do those topics. Yeah. I, I, th- I think I injected a brand new topic that we'll tackle some point later on. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Do you, do you, did you write it down? Yes. <laughs> My head. Oh, you got a better memory than I do. All right, that is that is going to wrap it up today's episode of the Switch RPG Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for no one who sent in their questions and comments. Keep them coming! Remember, you can listen to the show each and every week at SwitchRPG.com, or you can subscribe on your favorite favorite podcast app. If you listen to that, please give us a rating and review. We want to climb up those charts on those platforms. So your support there would be amazing. And finally, you can head over to Switch RPG for all your RPG needs on the Nintendo Switch. Until next time, I'll see you around. And don't forget, Johnny is the best person ever in the world. All right. Yes, he he put in the topic there. All right. Whatever. Goodbye, Johnny. 